Good evening and welcome to the second week of our Wednesday night Bible study in the book of Esther. Uh, if this is your first time joining with us, you really haven't missed much. The first week we went over just kind of an overview of the whole book. Uh, talked a little bit about what makes the book of Esther special and a little bit about the timeline of kind of where this book falls in the biblical narrative as a whole. And so uh, if you want to check out those videos, you can check out our, our website, our YouTube channel, or other places where we have things posted and uh, get caught up. But if you are jumping in for the first time this evening, uh, it, it's the perfect time because this evening we are going to be starting with Esther chapter 1. And what we see in Esther chapter 1 is really there is a lot of setup that takes place. And we're going to see different patterns. We're going to be seeing uh, different narrative elements that are going to be used and reused all the way through uh, the book of Esther. And, and the first person that we meet in this account is a king ruling over Persia during this time period. And that is King Ahasuerus. Now, before we jump into the text, it's important for us to understand exactly who this man is. And so who is this King Ahasuerus? Well, King Ahasuerus is the son of Darius the Great. Now, if you go to a Bible dictionary and you look up King Darius or King Darius, uh, you're going to find a couple different people. And sometimes the Bible just calls them King Darius. And so you might not know which one it is you're talking about. And so that's kind of important for our timeline as well. So there are about three different King Dariuses in the Old Testament. The first King Darius we run into is actually back in the book of Daniel. And, and this is Darius the Mede. Now, Darius the Mede is a king of Babylon, and he is most notably the king of Babylon during the time when Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. Uh, he had a very short reign over Babylon, uh, only about two years or so, uh, but he is a Babylonian king, Darius. Now, the next king that we meet in the Old Testament by that name is King Darius the Great, or also known as King Darius the First. Now, he is a Persian king. So if you remember our narrative and our timeline of biblical events, uh, you'll remember that the Babylonians took the Jews into exile, and then eventually God sent the Persian Empire to wipe them out. and. So now Persia is in control. Babylon is gone. Persia is in control of the area. And King Darius the Great is king over Persia during that time. Now he is known as a very good king, uh, especially to the Jews. Uh, we know that it is under his reign that the temple is beginning to be built. Uh, although it is Cyrus who gives the decree allowing the temple to be built. Construction on the temple really doesn't begin until the days of King Darius the Great. And so the Jews note him as a very kind king. He helps them. He gives them protection. He gives them supplies to go and build the temple. And uh, this is the Darius whose son we are looking at in the book of Esther. This King Ahasuerus is the son of King Darius the I. Um, now there's a third King Darius, and he shows up during the book of Nehemiah. So just know that as you're going through the biblical text, uh, sometimes people go by the same names several times in Scripture. And it's just important to know which figures you're looking at and talking about, uh, so that way you don't get them mixed up as you're going through the narrative. Now this King Ahasuerus, who is reigning over Persia during this time period, he actually goes by another name in history. See. Ahasuerus is actually the Jewish name or the Hebrew name for King Xerxes. Uh, if you know a lot about Middle, um, you know, ancient history, King Xerxes was a powerful king of the Persian Empire. Uh, eventually he goes to invade Greece. Um, but this is kind of before that happens. And so what we're going to see is that King Ahasuerus is, is reigning in Persia now. And as we jump into our text this evening, we're going to be seeing a lot about who he is, how he operates, and, and just the way he rules over his kingdom. And so with that being said, let's jump right into the text. We're going to be starting in Esther chapter 1, starting in verse 1. If you will uh, look at that text with me now. It says, 
Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all of the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast, lasting for several days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now, what we see here is, is that King Ahasuerus, he is giving this feast, he is having this celebration. And so the question we ask is, what would, what would lead to such a celebration during this time period? Why would he be throwing this lavish feast and this lavish gathering for all of his royal officials, all of his servants, all of the people who, who work for him and under him? Well, most likely, historically speaking, uh, we are seeing that this King Ahasuerus, he has just quelled a, a rebellion that has taken up in Egypt. The people there were rebelling against his rule. He sent armies in and they stopped the rebellion and brought peace back to the area. And so he is, wants to celebrate. He wants to come and, and show off his, his riches, show off his glory. Uh, and, and we know this mainly from historical records and other extra biblical sources. We're not told in the text here, but our best guess is, is that that's when he's celebrating as he is gathering all of his people. So we see that he has gathered the people to this feast. And it says that this celebration, this time, it talks about lasting 180 days and then having a feast at the end that lasts for seven days. And now some people get a little confused when they see these numbers jumping around and they think, oh my goodness, a feast that lasts for 180 days, six months of feasting and partying and all these different things taking place. Um, that's most likely not what took place. What probably happened is that for 180 days, all of the royal officials, all of the governors, all of the important prominent people of nobility that lived in the Persian Empire, they gathered in Susa, the citadel, the capital city. And for six months, they were all there together, meeting, talking, discussing, celebrating. And so they were all gathered in one place. And towards the end of this time of gathering, the king threw a feast, and that feast lasted for about seven days. And so what's the reason that, that King Ahasuerus is having this feast? Well, the text tells us he wants to show off his pomp. He wants to show off his glory and his riches. And he has a very vast empire, 127 providences all coming together in the citadel. He's just won this victory over Egypt, most likely. And he wants to show off a little bit. He wants to show them how rich he is. He wants to show them how powerful he is. He wants to show them uh, just what exactly being a part of the Persian Empire is really all about. And we can see, as we go into the next piece of text here, that, well, he doesn't pull any stops, and he definitely doesn't spare any expense. Uh, as we go to the next part of the text in verse 6 that says, there were white cotton curtains and violet, and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver and a mosaic of pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king." So we see this is quite a festivity, and, and the whole reason this is taking place is King Ahasuerus wants to show exactly how rich and wealthy and powerful that he is. And so we get this beautiful description of these pillars and these curtains, these, these velvet, uh, these violet purple, purple hangings that are all over the palace. They're sitting on couches made of gold, drinking out of golden vessels. This would have been just something huge to see. This would have been a wonderful feast to be in attendance of. And we know from extra biblical records that this is something the Persians did quite often as they would celebrate and they would show off. They loved their feasts and they loved their, their drinking and they loved their merriment. And we see that Ahas Ahasuerus fits right in 
um, to that whole scheme that's being played out in the Persian Empire. Now, what we're going to be seeing here is that as we unfold now, that's the setting that's been, been laid for us. We see that there's a celebration taking place. This feast is going on. All these powerful members of the nobility are gathered in Susa together. And as we continue on with the narrative, we're going to begin to notice a few things about Ahasuerus's character. And so we're going to be seeing those as we continue on in the text. Um, going through to verse 8, the text says, And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now, it's interesting to note about this edict that was made for drinking of the people. Um, it's a common law within the Persian Empire that if the king is at a feast and if the king is drinking, then everyone else needs to drink too. And so the whole idea here <clears throat> is that if the king were to raise his glass and take a sip from his cup, everyone in the company needs to go and take a sip from their cup as well. And now, why would you think that would be a law that the king would put in place in his empire? Why, why do you think it was so important that if the king is drinking, that everyone there present needs to be drinking as well? Well, the main reason was to ensure that the king himself wouldn't be the only one inebriated at a party or a feast. Uh, so that way that no one could maybe plot an assassination or plot some kind of coup while he's indisposed. And so the law was, hey, if the king's going to be drunk, everyone's going to be drunk right there with him. But the king makes an edict here. He says that, hey, here's the law that's going to be at this feast. This is a feast of merriment. This is a feast of joy. Uh, so no one's under compulsion. No one has to drink at this feast. And this really is kind of a flexing of King Ahasuerus's power. You know, he is invincible at this point. He feels strong. He feels powerful. He feels mighty. And so he's not worried or concerned that anyone's going to try to take his throne away from him. He, he doesn't really care one way or the other. But so he tells everyone, hey, no one has to drink. Now, at the same time that the king is hosting a feast for his nobles, his queen Vashti is also hosting a feast of her own for all of the ladies of nobility. You know, as these men would come in from the different parts of the providence, of the different parts of the empire, they would bring with them a, a large group of people. A large entourage would have come with each and every one of them. And so while the men were getting alone together and they were drinking and having their party, the queen would entertain all of the nobility and all of the wives of the nobility uh, herself. And so that's kind of what we see happening here. The men are in one place, the women are in another place. And we continue on in the next part of the passage in verse 10. Verse 10, the text says, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abgatha, Nethar, and Carcas, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. And this, at this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Now, a few different things are going on here at this part of the narrative, this part of our text. Um, first of all, there are some Jewish scholars, and if you look at some old Jewish writings, they actually would say that when the king ordered that Vashti be brought before him in her royal crown, uh, that the implication was that she should be wearing nothing but her royal crown, and that in his drunken state he wanted to show off just the, the naked beauty of his wife before all of these men. Now, if that's the case, it's pretty reasonable as to why she refused to come. Um, but also, there's some cultural elements that are taking place here. See, traditionally, a, a woman, especially the king's wife, would not be brought out into a public setting this way. It would have been considered very improper. It would have been considered very uncouth uh, for anything like that to happen and anything like that to take place. And so for the king to stand out and say, hey, I want you to come and bring my wife out here so that everyone can behold her beauty. 
Um, it's, it's just a very inappropriate thing to do. And this is something that we're going to see King Ahasuerus kind of do over and over again, that he gets to drinking and he gets to partying and he gets to having a good time and he just makes poor decisions and he makes decisions in the heat of the moment. He makes decisions without thinking and that seems to be one of those moments. There he is drinking with all of these members of nobility and, and maybe they're talking about you know their, their, their wives and they're talking about all the different things they have and the king wanting to show everyone up says well no one can match the beauty of my wife and so there he calls the queen and, and demands that she comes before them and shows off her beauty to all of them. And But the queen refuses to do so. And we're going to see in the next passage here is that, well, that triggers a series of events that, that really lead to the rest of our narrative. As we continue on in verse 13, the text says, Then the king said to these wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshina, Shintha, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and said first in the kingdom, According to law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus, delivered by eunuchs. So, here, the, the, the king feels insulted. He has ordered that Vashti come before him and the other men. She has flat out refused to do so, which tells you a thing or two about Vashti and the boldness that she has. And so the king looks at the seven princes, the princes of Persia that are sitting around him, and he begins to ask what should be done. And he quotes that these men are well versed in law, and that these men know the times. And so he's seeking their counsel as to what should be done to Queen Vashti because she has completely disobeyed an order. Now, about these noble lords and about the political system that took place in the Persian Empire, um, these seven noble lords, these seven princes of Persia, well, they represented noble houses within the Persian Empire. And these, these houses would have controlled much wealth. They would have controlled much power and much influence. And in fact, if the king were to take a wife, tradition would state that he would take a wife from one of these seven noble houses. So now, understand this, that these seven noble princes, they don't necessarily have the king's best interest in mind. They don't have necessarily the nation's best interest in mind. In fact, they simply have their own power, their own desire, and their own security as first and foremost in their minds. And so the counsel that they're going to give him, it's not the best counsel that they could give. Because here's what they're thinking. Well, if Vashti is queen, and we know that she's bold by just denying the king's request this way, she's bold, she's brash, she has power and authority of her own. Well, if we could get her removed from office, if we could get her removed from her place of power, well, then maybe one of our daughters could rise up and become the new queen of Persia, and that would be really good for our house. And so that's kind of what we see beginning to play out here, because really the wise advice would be to look at the king in his drunken state and to look at him and simply say, listen, you need to cool your heels a little bit. You need to go sleep on this. Wake up in the morning and see how you feel. But that's not at all what these men say. They don't let this be contained to a, a marital squabble or a simple domestic issue. But as we see in the next part of the text, they actually elevate this simple refusal to a, a national crisis. And so as we look at the next part of the text, we see the advice given to uh, King Ahasuerus by Memukin. In verse 16, it says, Then Memukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples are in all the providence of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all the women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. 
This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medians, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. For when, she de for when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all the kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. <laughs> and so what we see is that this noble official, uh, he doesn't advise that King Ahasuerus simply cool his heels and, and take a rest and sleep on it some. And, and he doesn't just say, oh, well, this is just a marital squabble. This is a small thing. Just let it lie. No, no. He elevates the crisis up to a national emergency. Now, understandably, as soon as Queen Vashti says she's not going to go bef appear before the king, gossip would have begun to spread through the court. Uh, the women at Vashti's feast would have started chattering to one another. Their servants would have found out. And it would have begun to eventually spread throughout the kingdom. And, and now this royal official comes in and he says, listen, these women are going to start to talk. And they're going to explain how Vashti refused her husband. And if nothing's done, well, that means all of the women in the kingdom are going to start speaking out against their husbands. They're not going to obey. They're not going to listen. We're not going to be able to keep control. And they're going to riot against our authority. They're going to riot against our power. And we simply cannot let that happen. And so in today's culture, we, you know, we live in the 20th century here. The whole idea seems absurd. The whole idea seems ridiculous. Uh, but he is painting this picture of just utter chaos that would take place simply because, well, no longer will women obey their husbands. Oh, what a tragedy that would be. And so as we look at the text here, he has a suggestion that he makes. He says that by royal decree, for if the king makes a decree, it cannot be overturned. Have Vashti sent away from your presence and have the title of queen be removed from her. Now understand that that Queen Vashti is not being exiled or anything from the, the Persian Empire. She's not being sent away as far as, you know, being removed and sent off to some far-off land to live in exile. Well, no, but what's happening here, it's a political move that's taking place. This, this royal official is looking at the king and saying, strip her of her title and send her back to the harem and never call on her and, and ordain that she will never appear before you again. And so... In this time period, you know, the king would have had a vast harem. He would have had all these women to attend him, and at any time he called one of them to him, they were supposed to appear. And women were not to appear before the king unless they were specifically called upon. And so this royal official is suggesting, strip Queen Vashti of her title, send her back to the harem, and decree that she is never to appear before you again. And so that's what's taking place. Vashti would still live in the palace. She would still live among the king's harem. But she would no longer have the ear of the king. She would no longer have any political influence. She would no longer have any ability to bend the king's ear and, and to advise him in any way. She wouldn't be able to make things happen. And that's exactly what these other royal officials wanted to see done. And so here, King Ahasuerus, he has heard the counsel. He has heard the advice that has been given to him. And, and here we begin to see what it is that he does with the advice. In verse 21, <clears throat> the text says, This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all of the royal providences, to every providence in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master of his own household and speak according to the language of the people. And so King Ahasuerus, he thinks that this is a great idea. He thinks that this is exactly what needs to be done. Now remember, he's still in a drunken state at this point. He has been drinking at this feast. He has been having a great time. And now he is pretty inebriated. And all of these princes and all of these officials, who probably are not nearly as drunk as he is, they're advising him to do these things. And then he just goes right along with whatever they say. 
And it says that this advice pleased him and it pleased the princes. And so he sends out this edict. And this isn't just a simple decree that he makes and then it's carried. No, it, they go and they write this into law. They write it in the many different languages that would occupy the Persian Empire. They send it out to all the different provinces. This would have taken weeks and weeks and months and months to get all of these different decrees out. And the decree was very simple, that every man is to be master of his own household and, and that they will rule their own household and that their wives should be subservient to them. And so that's the decree that goes out up to all the land. And that's kind of setting the stage of the events that are going to take place in the book of Esther. And we see that the king has had his feast. We see that Vashti has now been sent out of his presence to go live her days in the harem, no longer allowed to go before the king. And we also see that there is no queen ruling with the king over Persia. And that kind of brings us to the end of chapter 1. But as we come to the end of chapter 1, you know, what is it that we learn and what is it, you know, that, that we see taking place? Well, the, the first thing that we see is we see a lot about the Persian legal system that takes place. You know, as we look at, at the Persian legal system and the way that everything just kind of falls together, we see that the kingdom is ruled by decree and by edict. Uh, we also get a hint here that if the king makes a proclamation, if the king makes something into law, it cannot be overturned. And that's what the royal officials were hinting at. They said, because nothing that the king says can be overturned. And so that's kind of how the system works. The king goes and he makes an edict, he makes a proclamation, it's written into law, and nothing can change that. Now, one interesting thing is that that's not something that we learn. Uh, from extra biblical material. We don't see anything historically that points to that fact. And yet the Bible mentions it several times through many different books uh, concerning the Persian Empire. We see it in the book of Daniel as, as the king makes a decree that, that, you know, he is to, that anyone praying to another god is to be thrown into the lion's den. And then Daniel goes and prays, but the law can't be overturned, so Daniel has to go. Um, but it's just interesting that the Bible notes this in several different places, that once the king of Persia makes a decree, it cannot be overturned. Well, we also see that the king has a council of advisors that are, are acting with him. He doesn't just act on his own. He doesn't just lash out and do whatever he wants, but he takes the counsel of people around him. Now, in general, that sounds like a really good thing, but except here's the problem, is that the people who are surrounding the king they're not giving him good advice. They're not giving him the best advice at all. In fact, the advice they give him is pretty lousy. And the king just goes right along with it time and time and time again. Other things that we learn and we see in this passage is that we actually learn a lot about the patterns of Ahasuerus' own character. Um, we see here in this first chapter that he is a fan of his parties. He is a fan of his drinking. And uh, that's going to come back more than one time to bite him over and over and over again. We also see that, that he is very easily led astray, that, that the men that surround him, like we discussed a moment ago, they're going to continue to give him bad advice. Eventually, Haman's going to show up and give him bad advice. And over and over and over again, we are going to see that, that this king, Ahasuerus, he doesn't try to stand up for what's right. He doesn't even really try to make his own decision, but when someone comes to him with an idea or someone comes to him with some kind of advice, well, he's pretty easily manipulated, probably in part because of all the drinking that he is doing and all the partying that he is doing during the book of Esther. You know, one, another thing we're going to see that's a pattern of King Ahasuerus is his temper. You know, here we see that he it calls Vashti before him when she refuses to come. He gets angry and he gets upset. And in the middle of his rage, he makes this edict and this royal decree. You know, all of a sudden, because in a moment of frustration, in a moment of anger, the entire kingdom has an edict put over them to where suddenly men are to rule their households and women are to be subservient to them. And that all came because of a rash decision that he made. And we're going to see that happen over and over and over again. The king is going to rashly make decisions, rashly blind and blindly follow the judgments of those around him. And it's going to get him and the Jews in a whole heap of trouble. 
as they move forward. And so these are just patterns to notice, and these are things that, that the narrative is setting up, and we're gonna watch time and time again these things come up over and over and over to cause more and more problems in our narrative. You know, the, the third thing that we learn as we go through is that we're going to be seeing that the vastness of the Persian Empire, and we see that come to play in, in this part of the text. You know, we saw that, that there are 127 providences that, that are all gathered together in the citadel. We see the riches and we see the wealth of King Ahasuerus and the riches and the wealth of the Persian Empire. They're sitting on couches made of gold. They're drinking out of golden vessels. There's all these beautiful tapestries in the feast. The feast lasts for seven days. Um, there are women who are going to be brought in from all around the empire. And this is a wealthy and powerful king. And what is so funny is that in all of his wealth and in all of his power, he is still manipulated, and he is still pushed around, and he is still simply made to do what others want him to do. And that's part because of, again, what we see that he represents in this whole book and account in the book of Esther. We remember that King Ahasuerus, well, he represents sinful, carnal man, and he is led by his desires. He is led by his 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 tastes and his passions and his thirst and we're going to see time and time again that as he is led by his passions as he is led by his desires as he's led by his stomach uh, that he is going to be continuing to get in a heap of trouble over and over and over again and so uh, that is book or chapter one of the book of esther um, and, and we're going to be seeing that what has been set up here, the big problem that has been set up, uh, that now there is no queen to rule over Persia with the king, um, pretty quickly those advisors are going to come up with a plan as we jump into chapter 2 next week. Um, I, I hope that you have enjoyed this time that we have had together this evening. Uh, I've definitely enjoyed going through chapter one of the book of Esther. And I encourage you to hop back with us again next week as we go through chapter two. Thanks again for being with us this evening. Uh, I hope you have a great week and God bless.